Welcome to Tacoa Church. We are glad you're with us today, whether you're joining us online or to one of our neighborhood churches. And if it is your first time with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We are Austin and Allie Anderson, the lead pastors, and we moved to San Jose five years ago. We moved here not knowing anyone. We were looking for new jobs. We were starting over, and we had this hope, though, that God was going to provide. We knew that He would provide because we could trust in Him, and so we had this hope that He was going to carry out this vision that He had given us. And now, five years later, we have the reality of Tacoa Church, and that is the message that Austin is going to share today as we continue our series, What Do I Do Now? Uh, that message of hope, how we can live with hope in our daily lives. And so this is really vital to who we are as a church. Our vision is that we would believe in God and go as He leads, experiencing freedom and hope. One of the other things that was really important to us as we started the church was that we were a church that was in the community. We call mm -hmm. it Live Love Local here. That's one of our values. We want to be a people that is invested in our city, our community, the businesses, those in need around us. And one of the ways we've been living that out as we start the church is we have a team that has been partnering with Opening Doors and they go twice a month on a Saturday to feed some of those that are homeless and in need in our city, in our community downtown. Check out this video to see some of what they're doing. Hi, I'm Janine with Tacoa Church. Our model is Live Love Local, and uh, we're here at Opening Doors today uh, to help serve food for the homeless. We're a startup church. Right now we're just in the community trying to help wherever we can and to show love to the community. Come on down, it's really easy. Serve and uh, give back to those that are in Yeah, live love local. According to the scripture, we need to uh, love God first and love others. And this is how we show love to others. Like other people really here. Thank you. I feel love. Yay! What a great video and opportunity to serve our community. If you'd like to find out more about signing up this Saturday to serve, you can go to our website under the events page and sign up there and find out more information. So before we go into our message, I'm going to pray for Austin and I just encourage you take out a pen or your phone um, and get ready to take some notes but I'll pray for us and invite the Holy Spirit into our time together. Lord God, I just thank you again for the hope that we can have in you. God, I thank you that our hope is not uh, something that is defined in this world, um, in our changing circumstances or changing situation, God, but that we have a hope that is, that is steadfast and firm. And God, I just thank you that um, we get to talk about that and be reminded of that today. And so I pray that you would speak through Austin, that you would just empower him with your words and speak to each of our hearts during our time together. We just thank you for community and this time together. In your name, amen. Amen. This week, we are wrapping up our first series as a church. It has been a great series for us to start with as we look at how do you live a life filled with purpose and meaning. And as a church, that's our mission. We want to equip you to find and live out your purpose so essential to our lives. We believe as a church that when you believe in God and go as he leads, when you're living out your purpose, that you are going to experience freedom and hope in your life. Last week, we took a look at freedom. This week, we're going to take a look at how you can live a life characterized by hope. That's something that I know I want more of in my life. I want more hope in my life. I know when times get difficult, I want to be able to look ahead with vision, look ahead with hope to give, not give up, to look forward with good expectations. And as a people, we love cheering on others who had hope, cheering on people who faced a difficult situation and they didn't give up that when it looked like there's no way, there's no hope, they had hope and they persevered. I mean, life gets hard and we wanna believe that there's good things in store. We wanna believe that when our life gets hard, we, should, we can have hope just like those other people had hope and they made it through. We wanna believe that we can make it through as well. 
And when I think about this, I think about the movie Remember the Titans. And I've been thinking about this movie more re recently with some of just the tensions that are continuing, unfortunately, to go on in our country. I've been thinking about this movie where it's set in the South at the time where schools are called to integrate with black and white students together in the same school. And uh, it's set in the South, so football is really important. And they bring in a black coach to this white school that is now integrated with black and white. And this coach's job is to integrate the team together, and that is a challenge. They are integrating this school, bringing people together. And in the middle of this, a white person in power in the city comes to the coach and tells him, if you lose even one game, you're out. You've lost. And in the movie, you see a team come together. You see a team come together. And in the middle of a situation where even they lose their star player, seems like all hope is lost. They're down at the end of the game. All hope is lost. But you're cheering for the team. You're cheering for the team that believes, you know what, we can make it. We're going to make it through this. And this is life. We want to cheer for those to make it. We want to believe that when all hope is lost, that we can make it. And these stories inspire us that in our challenges, we can be victorious as well. And if you're anything like me, you could use a little bit more hope in your life. I know for my family, September was a challenging month. And this year has brought many challenges with it. The challenges of just friendship and work and life seem to finally have caught up with us. And despite how amazing of a month it was, and we are living in that and we are excited about much of what is happening as a church, what's happening for our family, but that doesn't mean the challenges don't go away. And in the middle of those challenges, hope is so important. Hope keeps us moving forward. And just like in that movie, hope is what gets us through and hope inspires us. It looks ahead and says, I can make it through too. Hope looks ahead and says, life will be good. See, hope is inherently future-oriented, but present-located. It impacts our present. Hope defines how we move forward. It how, defines how we deal with life's situations now because of what we think is coming in the future. It Hope says good things are coming, and so I'm going to act a certain way now. It physically and mentally can change our present. And today I want to share with you how you can have more hope in your life, how you can live today with hope. And hope is either going to be justified or not in that situation with the football team. Either it works out or it doesn't. And we want to have our hope put in things that work out. We want to have hope justified that we make it through, that the team wins, that things are successful. No one wants to hope in something that's untrue. The person that we hoped in, that something false happens, that that person doesn't make it, they don't come through for us, we want to have our hope justified. And if you give up in the middle, you often don't see the hope justified. When you're at the game rooting for your team and there's 60 seconds left and your team is down and you see a person with hope, they're going to stick it out to see what happens. Somebody else is like, I'm going to get out of here so that I can beat the crowds and the traffic and I'm going to get home. At least when people could go to football games, that's what happened. <laughs> but if the team comes back, that person that stayed is justified. They get to celebrate in being there for the victory with their team. The person that left, they didn't stick it out. They don't get to see it. But if the team doesn't even win, then the hope wasn't justified. It wasn't worth it. We want to put our hope in things that are seen to be true. It's a good feeling when hope works out. It's not a great feeling when hope doesn't work out. And right now, in this year, with the things that we're facing, we want to put our hope in the right thing. Right now, I believe that you can have hope in the middle of whatever you're going through. I don't know what you're facing, but God does, and He wants to offer you hope. Hope can get you through to the end, and it can allow you to have joy in the middle of our trials and challenges of life. Hope is crucial. Hope says that the challenges that we are facing, the challenges I'm facing right now, it's worth it. And what I want to share with you today is how you can be filled with more hope. How you can be filled with more hope. How you can hope in two things. One, your eternity that God has promised for you. And 
filled with hope in the goodness of what is to come in this life, what is to come tomorrow. Jesus offers us hope. He is the source of hope. So before we jump into the verse we're going to look at today, let's define hope. Hope is the positive outlook of the things that are to come in the future. Hope is a positive outlook of the things that are to come into the future. It's the, that the future is going to be good, that it's going to be better than it is today, um, the future of tomorrow, the future of a year from now. And sometimes we use hope as a way to communicate that we want something to happen. Sometimes we say, we, you know, we hope we're going to win the lottery or we hope our team that's horrible is going to make it, whatever it might be. We can hope in something where the chances aren't very good. We can hope in a lot of things. We can also despair. Despair is the opposite of hope. It's thinking that everything is just going to get worse, that it's not worth it. Life is horrible. Hope, on the other hand, sees the future as different. Hope sees the future as good. It sees the present challenges that we're facing as being worthwhile. Hope is inherently future-oriented, and it's inherently looking at the future as a good thing. We all, though, no matter how positive outlook we are, we could use more hope in our lives. So let's look at this. We're going to look at Romans 5 today. Romans is a letter that Paul, who was one of the very first leaders in the Christian church, wrote to a group of people living in a challenging time. They were a group of people living in Rome. It's written to the, the Romans. And these people faced a lot of trials. They faced a lot of challenges from the government. They faced challenges from the people around them. And life was just hard. And Paul is writing this letter to them to explain the truth of their situation and to give them hope in their situation. And I don't know about you, but it sounds a little bit like some of our situation today. There's challenges around us in life, and we could use some truth, we could use some hope in our lives. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and this is what it says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's break it down today. First, we have been justified by faith. Our sin has put us into a, a position where our relationship with God has been damaged. We chose to disobey God, who created us originally as perfect. God himself was perfect and holy, and we disobeyed. God allowed us to do this. This is called sin. The consequence of it is that it destroyed our relationship with him. This is the reality of humanity, that God is perfect and we are not, and so we need help restoring our relationship to him. God sent Jesus to earth to restore that relationship for you and me and our, the entire world. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, and then not deserving of death because of his perfection, he didn't deserve it but he willingly offered himself up on the cross on our behalf. He died because he died after having lived and not deserving the death. He was raised to new life again. And God has said that for those that put their hope in Jesus, their faith in Jesus and trust him, that he will restore their relationship. God will restore our relationship with him and look at us as perfect as, as Jesus was perfect instead of the sinful life we looked at. And this is how Paul starts this passage. Because of our justification before God, basically because we have had our relationship with God restored, due to our faith, we now have peace with God. And because of that, that is worthy of hope. And through him, through what Jesus did, we now have access to God. And it's Jesus who restored this and made this relationship possible the one that does that for us today, and he's offering it to you today if you want access to that. It says, verse 2, we have been granted access to God's grace. Grace is a gift. Grace is something you don't deserve. Matter of fact, grace is when you deserve punishment, you get a gift instead. That sounds pretty good to me. I like gifts, 
And when I mess up, I definitely don't want punishment. I would definitely prefer a gift. So we deserve punishment for our sins. Grace says God has restored us to relationship and he has given us good things by God. One of the good things that he has given us, one of those gifts, is hope. God has granted us hope for our lives when we deserve despair and death. He has given us hope instead. The first thing I want to share is what he goes on to say. It says, we rejoice in the hope for heaven. We rejoice in the hope for heaven. This is the, the first point for today. This is why we hope. We hope for eternity. We hope for heaven. We hope because our relationship with God has been restored. It says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We are not trapped anymore in our sin. We are not trapped with the consequences of it. We stand instead under grace and we stand in a restored relationship with God. If you missed the message last week, I encourage you to go and listen to it and a message on how you can experience freedom in your life. We have been set free and this is a cause for hope for us because our relationship with God has been restored and part of the grace in which we stand is that we now get to live a life of hope looking forward to what God has offered. It says, we have hope in the glory of God. Maybe I should wait a minute because that's definitely not language I use. It's probably not language you use. What does that mean, to hope in the glory of God? The previous two chapters explained a little bit further of what this concept meant of the glory of God and why we should hope in it. But the basis of this is, is that Paul is reminding the hearers, he's reminding us that God is perfect and holy, and he has glory because of that. Humanity was once created at the beginning perfect as well. Humanity also had glory. But we messed that up. Now, though, with a restored relationship because of what Jesus did, we can hope in glory once again. We can hope in God's glory and not our glory because we are going to have glory again one day. We get to hope for the future. We hope in the re restored relationship of God. We hope in eternity. This is the basis of hope in our present situation. No matter what we're going through, we can look ahead and say it doesn't matter what happens because at the end of time, it's going to be good. God has promised restored relationship with him. This hope is not an earthly hope. This hope is not what might happen. This is a guarantee that down the road in the future, we have been promised restored relationship with God. God has promised us this. It says in 1 Thessalonians, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. We know that our eternity is secure. That because of our faith in Jesus, we have been promised a restored relationship with God. This is great news. This affects where we are today. I'm not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not worried about whether I'm going to get sick. I'm not worried about whether I'm going to die. I'm not worried. And this has characterized my life. It's characterized what I've done. I am wise. I try to avoid bad situations when I can. I don't like to go into them, but I'm not worried about it. If God calls me to step into a risky situation, it's okay. If I face a challenge in life, it's okay because I know that no matter what happens, whether I live for 35 years or I live for 100 years, it's going to be okay because my eternity is secure because of my faith in Jesus. This is the first point that we have hope because our eternity is secure in Jesus. The second thing is that we can rejoice and have hope for tomorrow. We can rejoice and have hope for tomorrow. Christianity sometimes gets criticized. I've sometimes had this challenge of only looking ahead to the future, only looking forward to what happens after we die, to have just a focus on that. But hope is not just for heaven. Hope is for today, it's hope is for tomorrow, and hope is for this life, this world. God has promised to be with us. He's promised good things. He's not promised that life will be free and easy and no challenges, but he's promised that it will be good. He's promised that he will be with us 
no matter what happens. And because of that, we can hope for tomorrow, that tomorrow will be good. We rejoice, not just in our eternity, but also in our sufferings. Let me say that again because it's not an obvious truth. We rejoice in our sufferings. This is what Paul is saying in verse 3. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. This is a great statement. It's a statement I want to be able to say that I rejoice in my sufferings. I mean, I don't want to go through the suffering, but if I'm in one, I want to be able to say, well, I can rejoice here. So what does he say? How can we do that? How can we hope in the middle of our suffering? This is how, because our sufferings can create an increased hope in our lives. So let's go through this. It says, know that suffering produces endurance. This part, I can follow. Anyone here a runner? My wife was a marathon runner when I met her. She's still a runner. She hasn't run a marathon in a while, but she's still a runner. And when I met her, I was a young guy and I wanted to impress the girl. And so despite my asthma, I was like, sign me up. I will run with this girl. I will run a marathon. Well, not a marathon. I wasn't quite that crazy. I said, I'll run a half marathon. (laughs) I can tell you two things from this experience. The first thing I can tell you is that crossing the finish finish line in any amount of time means that I can say I ran a marathon. As long as I ran a little bit and I cross the finish line, I can walk, I get there. As long as I get there, I ran a half marathon. I did it. The second thing I can tell you is that suffering does produce endurance. The more we train, the more we um, prepare, The more we go through that suffering, the more we are able to endure in the future. And Paul continues by saying, and suffering, or sorry, and endurance produces character. Endurance produces character. When I suffered training for a marathon, I broke down my muscles, they grew back stronger. Suffering produced a change in me. I got healthier, my lungs got stronger. My body changed, my mind changed to let me endure knowing that I could make it through. You want to improve your character, endure the trials. You have to endure though. You have to endure in the right way because we can get pessimistic. We can get hurt. We can get burned. We can get full of despair. And the Bible uses the word fruit. It says that we as people produce fruit. It's either good fruit or bad fruit. We start to be full of patience and kindness and goodness and hope and joy and life. Or we can be full of despair and anger and bitterness and just bad people. We can have bad fruit. When we suffer, when we endure, then we produce character. So endure well. Paul continues, he says, and character produces hope. We got back to hope. A tested character comes out of the sufferings of life with not a crushed spirit, but a hopeful spirit. An expectation of good things for the future. An expectation that, man, I made it through there and I'm stronger now. I have more hope next time I face a trial or a challenge. I have even more hope because I know I can make it through because I know that God is going to be with me through it and help me through it. Hope, though, like a muscle, will not grow strong if it's unused. We need to train it correctly. You know, I know people that have powered through a marathon without training. I don't know how, but they did it and they regret it because of just the brokenness of their body at the end. Now, anybody that makes it to the end of a marathon is going to have some pain because their body worked really hard. But if you trained for it and endured and built your body up for it, you can get through it and be stronger because of it and not broken down because of it. And this is what we want to do as people. As believers in Jesus, we want to have a faith and a hope that endures and that endurance produces character and that character produces more hope for the future because we saw that God is with us. We saw that he provides. God is faithful. It says in verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because we hope in God. We know that he is faithful. He's not going to let us down. Our hope is going to be in something good and genuine. It is not in something that isn't going to work out. It's not a hope and a prayer of this might happen. God has promised to be with us and he has promised an eternity for us. 
Hope does not put us to shame because our God is faithful. And hope affects us today. This is the third thing I want to share. Our hope for eternity and our hope for good things in the future, this affects our present. Remember what I said, hope is inherently future-oriented, but it is present-located. It affects us now. See, we don't worry about sickness or death because we know that heaven is waiting. We take precautions, but if we get sick, it's okay. We don't worry about our finances. We're generous. We plan for our future, but we know that no matter what happens, no matter how much money we have, that we can't account for everything. The stock market can tank. We can lose our job. Who knows what happens, but God is with us. Hope affects our present. We trust in God's goodness and his promise to be with us in the future. No matter what happens with our relationships, no matter what happens with our life. We hope in a lot of things, but hope is belief in the goodness of the future. Do you hope in money, a relationship, or retirement, or a president, or what is your hope in? What are you putting your hope in? And is it something that's going to actually happen? That is actually going to be found to be true? Because our hope in Jesus is true and God will provide for us. Hope moves us to action. We see it. One of the important things is that the more we look at those around us, the more our hope can be built. When we look at our past or we look at other people's past, our hope is built for the future. Hope is a condition. It's an attitude of rejoicing for the future. And I want to share an analogy with you right now about life. See, it says that in 1 Corinthians, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. If I told you we were having a race and the winner of the race got a hundred million dollars, I probably got your interest you would want to win this race. Next, I would tell you that in this race, it's a car race and you need to pick a car to win the race. So which car do you pick? I'm going to offer you some cars. Do you pick car number one? That's a fun car. <laughs> maybe not the car you would pick. Maybe it is the car you would pick. Do you pick car number two? Now that one looks fast. That one looks like it's got some potential. Do you pick car number three? This car I've seen in real life and I don't really know what else to say about this one. <laughs> How about car number four? That one looks tough and like it's got some strength to it. Lastly, do you pick car number five? One looks fast as well and you know, if you are somebody that you know, is really environmentally conscious, maybe this is the car you're gonna pick. Which of these do you stake your hope for $100 million on? Which one do you pick? This is like life. We're all trying to win at life. So what vehicle do you pick? Do you pick the one that's easiest to drive? Do you pick the cheapest? Do you pick the most expensive? Do you pick the one that's going to fit the big family that you want to have? Here is what is important in the race of life. Which car gets you to the finish line because if you don't get there in any race it matters if you don't get to the finish line it doesn't matter how fast you went in the first 10 seconds how far you got if you don't make it it doesn't count for anything so we want to pick a car we want to pick a vehicle that is going to get us to the finish line what happens when you encounter an obstacle in the race do you have a car that can get you through it most of these cars are not going to make it through maybe you you know and call in helicopter support and get you over the top of the, the obstacle. But eventually it's not going to be enough. Eventually we're going to face obstacles that we can't get through if we don't have the right vehicle. And God has promised to get us through when we put our trust in Him. He's promised that no matter where we're at in the race course, when we turn to Him, He will provide the way forward. No matter what obstacle we face, He will provide a way through. We can get through anything with Him. This is God's promise to us. And he has promised that no matter how long it takes us to get to the finish line, no matter how we get there, he has promised eternity with him. He has promised that he will provide for us. And this is our hope. So today, this is what I want to share with you. Put your hope in the right things 
in this world. Put your hope in Jesus and you will be able to make it through to the finish line well. You will be able to make it through whatever challenges you're facing in life. We have a basis for hope because of what Jesus did for us. We have a hope in eternity that God has promised good things and heaven is going to be great. God has also promised to be with us in life. He's promised to provide for us. No matter what challenges face, we can look at them with hope because we know that no matter our current challenges, our suffering, that we're going to have more hope. We're going to be able to be closer to God because of it. We look at what he has done and we can have more hope. We can look at what he has promised and we know that God's promises are true so that you can have more hope in your life. It says later in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. This is open to everybody. We just need to confess and believe. Confess that you've messed up. Confess that you are now putting your belief in Jesus and he has promised to restore your relationship with God. Today, No matter where you're at, I invite you, return to God. Return to Jesus and say, I believe and I confess and I'm putting my trust and my hope in you. And I want to give everyone this morning that opportunity. No matter where you are at in your faith journey, God has an open invitation to you. So I want to invite you, put your faith and your trust in him now. I invite everybody to just bow your heads and pray with me this morning. And if you want to put your trust in Jesus, Pray these words with me. God, I have messed up. I have sinned in my life. And I'm choosing to return to you. I confess that I'm not perfect. And I put my belief in you. I choose to follow you with my life. Amen. If you prayed that with us this morning. I invite you, no matter where you're at in your faith journey, I invite you, let us know. We want to come alongside you. We want to pray for you. Um, Allie is going to share in a minute how you can submit a TACOA card. So mark that on there. We want to pray and celebrate with you. And for everybody, I want to invite you back next week. We just wrapped up our first series as a church. Next week, we are going to continue with the question of how do I keep my faith? When life is challenging, how do, I, how, do I, how do I keep my faith? There are many stories of people in the Bible that were in challenging situations and they kept their faith and God provided. We're going to look at different of those stories each week, different people, how they kept their faith. And, and I believe, and I shared a little bit today, that when we look at other people's stories of how God provided for them, that can build our faith and our hope today because we know that our God is faithful. So come back next week for the start of that series. What a great reminder of the hope that we have in Jesus and how that can help bring us peace in our daily lives. And this hope we feel like is something that is so important in this season as so many of us are maybe struggling or having a hard time, but we really want to be able to bring hope and encouragement to our community. And we'd love to invite you in to be part of our team, to get connected with what we are doing, that we can help bring that hope and encouragement to those in our community. And that's why we ask you to complete this TACOA card each week. We want to find ways to connect with you, to support you in your life's journey. And so you can indicate on the TACOA card now by going to either the website or the app, ways that we can pray for you, ways that we can connect you with one of our community groups, and really ways that we can just support you in your faith journey. So be sure to fill that out now, and we'd love to be able to connect with you this week. We also take time each week to worship God through our giving. And this is something that we feel like is so important that we are grateful to be able to do because we feel like God has given so much to us, we want to be able to give back to Him. And for those of you who call Sakoa Church your home, now is your time to give. We are so grateful to those of you who have partnered with us and trusted God with your finances. We also want to close our time together by just sharing a couple exciting opportunities that are coming up. So one of those is Alpha, which 
started last week, but it's not too late to join. So if you're interested in finding out more, we encourage you to go to our website and sign up. It happens on Tuesday nights over Zoom. And this is a way for a group that you can dig deeper in community, you can find out more about Jesus and ask questions about faith and life. We also want to let you know if you have kids, we invite you to check out our Tacoa Kids page. We have some exciting resources and videos up for October, so be sure to check that out. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next week as we start our new series, Keeping the Faith. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. If you joined us live, I wanna invite you to the online group that we have that starts right now. And you can join that group by clicking the link either below or above in the description, depending on where you're joining us from. I wanna invite you there. We dive in a little bit more to the message and discuss further. Is it time for us to spend in community and get to know one another a little bit more, even online from wherever we're joining from? I invite you right now, come check out our online group.